Okay, I give you the screen access, Jordy. Yeah, yeah, there's actually It'll be better if they play it. So it's 3.30, do you want to start your... I, I will, as soon as we're... Um... No, I meant the begging for the... Uh... Yeah. So we're going to get going in a minute, um, but we are looking for a note taker. Kyle has pre-populated the, the Etherpad with the uh, appropriate metadata, so it really is just a question of capturing a few notes along the way. We have a volunteer. Anyone? Anyone? Oh, I see a hand raised back there beside Sanjay. No, the person beside you raised his hand. Sorry, I can't see no, the hand. No. Yeah. <laughs> ah, ah. We can't actually get started until we have a note taker. It's relatively easy here in MOPS. We don't make 100,000 decisions. Don't have big arguments. I'm not going to volunteer to do it myself, so everybody needs to... <laughs> Slink down in their chairs or else they'll be randomly volunteered. So we don't want to have a meeting today is what you're telling me. Shall we send the mic around the room and have people explain why they don't want to take notes? <laughs> Yeah, but that you'd be welcome. It'd be a great training if you'd like to. How, how would that be evaluated? To, to do it? Sure. <laughs> it, it, really, it really is very easy. It, you don't yes. need to. Yeah, you don't need to. It's not capturing the narrative. You're not because we're already being recorded and all that. Right. It's just to in the notes thing in case somebody makes a decision or says, let's you know refer this to some other working group. Just make a note of that in the document. That, right. We, we, we decide to do that, so. Do not feel obligated to, to transcribe right. what's happening. Because as you see, we already have a screen that's doing that part. <laughs> Chris um, Swine says, I can handle that notes for any decisions that All right, so I think that means Chris Lemons has volunteered to be our note taker. Thank you. Um, but everybody, certainly, uh, particularly newcomers, should feel free to get into the note pad as a shared document and see the process as it goes along. And everybody else can help out Chris, who's remote, as we go. And thanks again, Chris. OK, uh, Kyle, have we worked out who's driving? Yeah, I'll share. I'll give me a second. Thanks. All righty. Uh, so here we are actually at IETF 120. My bad, didn't update the slide properly. Didn't get the date on it though. So there's that. Uh, the Media Operations Working Group. Um, next slide. 
Um, you should all note well that you are at the IETF and that has various um, expectations in terms of processes and policies, um, particularly in the context of IPR. If you are aware you have an IETF contribution that is covered by patents or patent applications that are owned or controlled by you or your sponsor, you have to disclose that. Um, and also be aware that um, you acknowledge that written audio and video and photographic records of this meeting may be made public. Uh, I'm not actually gonna read all of it, but you should be familiar with this note well. Next slide, please. And then apparently we have to note really well some things this time. This is in the standard deck for this, year, this meeting. Um, that effectively that we are, we do in fact have code of contact for our behavior here. So we are all expected to behave well and create and maintain an environment for constructive contributions by and from everybody. So uh, we will be taking that seriously as well. Um, there are venues for um, dealing with the situation. If you feel you have been harassed in any way, um, please do raise your concern in confidence with the ombuds people. Um, next slide. Yeah, meeting tips, some of which you've probably already figured out. The one thing I wanna emphasize is that we are using the meet echo queue for handling the questions queue. So even if you are in the room, please make sure that you sign in uh, and there's the cat. Um, please make sure that you sign in and um, use that for raising your hand to ask questions. And yes, Kyle, once again, I'm deeply envious that you have a cat at the meeting. Okay. Um, yes, next slide, please, if your cat will permit. Yeah, various resources for the week. Next slide, please. And at last, here we are. Uh, we are at the agenda for this meeting. Um, we have noted well. Glenn is so supportive. He's given me a cat to hold. Mickey <laughs> <laughs> Glenn. Um, I'm Leslie Nagel, I'm co-chair of the working group. Kyle Rose, uh, my co-chair, was has been crowdstruck and is unable to join us um, in person. And Glenn Dean up here um, is our technical advisor for the working group. So um, the, here is the plan of action. It is the agenda that has been posted. I didn't manage to get the if slides rece received in time to review off of this version of the agenda. I'm sorry. Um, yes, we are going to proceed as planned unless there are any bashes to this agenda. Not seeing any, let's proceed. Um, so there's a quick update on the working group documents. Um, the media operations use case for an extended reality application on edge computing infrastructure is in fact in the RFC editor queue. So yay, congratulations to us and the document editors. Um, and the uh, treaty end document has been updated. It is in the ISG's um, queue for consideration and at last report, the latest revision handled many of the concerns, but I think the authors expect to make one more revision to address further outstanding re review comments. Um, so that one is progressing as well. Any comments or questions about either of the working group documents? Okay. Um, so then we will move right along to other IETF work. Uh, we have an update on the media operations, nope, not media operations, MO can stand for other things, for mock from a media perspective by Alan Prindel. Uh, that working group is meeting later this week. So after uh, Alan's update to us, perhaps you'll be encouraged to go along and engage. Alan, would you like to take the floor? Is it okay, Bob? And uh, Alan, are you are you intending to present the slides or? Uh, I, it's a. Can I have you guys present the slides? Yeah, I'll I'll do it. Just tell me when you when you want to switch to uh, to doing the video. Uh, and okay. Wh who will be who will be broadcasting that? I think Meet did we get Meet Echo is going to present play the video when we tell them to with a match. Okay, great. Uh, okay, so can, can somebody, yeah, there we go, share my slides. Okay, uh, 
Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Vancouver. Uh, my name is Alan Frindell. I work for Meta and I'm the co-chair of the Media Over Quick Working Group. I'm going to give you just kind of an update on, you know, starting from the big picture of what's going on in MOQ, some of the design decisions we're making. Jordy's going to give a demo of some stuff that we can do with MOQ today, and we'll have some questions. Next slide, please. So uh, this is a picture that I use to explain what MOQ is internally, but uh, if you think about an axis with uh, latency uh, increasing along the bottom and the scalability of the application going up, we can think about like a VC call is very low latency, but they don't scale up the same kind of uh, number of users that you might with live streaming, which has uh, a little bit higher latency, but can scale to the millions. And so what we see is that live streaming applications are trying to get lower latency, VC calling is trying to scale up, and we're hoping to build a protocol that can solve both of these use cases, and really sort of unify these two stacks while both like improving the uh, capabilities of both kinds of applications. Next slide. So we've taken MOQ, we've broken it down and sliced it into a number of different layers that we're working on uh, independently. So at the, at the bottom of this, uh, picture, you can see uh, stuff that we are not working on, which is uh, quick and web transport, but those are things that we use. Uh, one of the primary documents that we have adopted and we spend most of our time working on is called Media Over Quick Transport. Uh, that is largely a pub sub protocol that is for the most part media agnostic. You can transport other things uh, over uh, this protocol besides uh, media, uh, though it is called Media Over Quick Transport. Um, and then on top of that transport, there are uh, going to be media applications, and there are some individual drafts that describe media applications. One of the simple ones we use for interop testing now is a simple text to chat protocol that uses the pub sub capabilities. There's also one called warp, which is a full blown media specification. But again, these have not yet been adopted into the working group, but there is work happening on those documents. And then we have some supporting documents. One of them is a new container format for media uh, called low overhead container. Uh, that is something that matches the, what you would have if you took the output from web codecs or you want to input into web codecs. Uh, it's a very simple container that can be used for transporting media. So we find that to be useful. And we have a catalog, which if you're familiar with HLS or Dash is kind of like manifest, but it's a little bit more uh, purpose built. It's like a reimagining what a manifest can be. And that's another standalone component that can be reused in other places. So these are, these are the kinds of different things that the working group is working on at, at various stages. Next slide, please. So going into some of the design decisions uh, that the working group has made so far, uh, one of them is the object model. So what MF media over quick transport moves around, we call those tracks. And a track can be broken up into one or more logical groups. And a group can contain one or more objects. And uh, it's very flexible. You can uh, create lots of groups, many objects, a single object per group. So there's a lot of flexibility in how you build your application. We're sort of providing at this layer just Legos for people uh, to use. Um, next slide, please. This is sort of a, a high level picture of the actors involved. So if you're creating a track, we call that your, the original publisher. And then when you think of a, a relay that is either doing caching or fan out or both as a combination of a subscriber and a publisher and media will flow through these relays and then uh, the subscribers that are consuming these tracks and one way or another we call them end subscribers. But um, this is just sort of a way to visualize the, the flow and the terminology that, that we've adopted. The working group has certainly spent a fair bit of time trying to find the right terminology that everybody's happy with uh, for coming from both live streaming and VC type world. Next slide. Uh, the working group spent a lot of time in the last year trying to figure out, okay, what, how are we gonna take this object model that we're happy with and how does that map to the transport uh, capabilities of quick or web transport, meaning streams or datagrams. And the current thinking, the, what's currently encoded in our drafts is that it's sort of a choose your own adventure. Applications can choose to map uh, an entire track to a single stream or a group to each group to its own stream, or every object can be its own stream, or objects can also be datagrams. Uh, and it's really up to the application to choose the appropriate uh, transport mapping based on the reliability and ordering semantics that they're looking for in the data. So the, the use case people bring for, for, uh, for datagrams is often audio in terms of uh, its tolerance for loss and reordering. Um, 
versus like there may be cases like certain tracks, like catalog tracks, which it makes much more sense for them to be uh, entirely in a single stream. Next slide. Just recently, uh, last month, uh, we met for a multi-day interim to try to figure out what we wanted to do uh, for prioritization. And the working group, I think, uh, managed to come to a consensus that's been merged in the draft we just published uh, earlier this month uh, around how to do prioritization. And essentially, they've settled on both subscribers and publishers get uh, input into the priority process. Generally speaking, the subscriber overrides the publisher. The person who's watching knows that they want the audio first or the bigger video first, whatever it is. Um, there's also multiple dimensions of priority. So uh, there's sort of what we call inter-track priority. So you can express, like I mentioned, the relative importance of the audio track versus the video track. Or if you're doing simulcast, the relative importance of small video, medium size, or large videos, if they're all coming at the same time. But there's also a dimension of priority, which is within a single track. Uh, which is sort of the order of groups and uh, we like to think of that kind of like fidelity versus freshness so if you're if you're watching a live stream and you're behind the live head then you might think about you always want to receive older information before newer information because you don't want you need that information to prevent your player from stalling versus a real-time live call might prefer freshness they might prefer like look that data is old i just want the newest if there's new stuff available send me the new stuff first so we have these multiple dimensions that we track uh, and there's something that we're, we're close to, but have not quite landed, which is the concept of delivery timeout, which is the partial reliability aspect of MOQ, which is, uh, I want this thing, but if you can't get it to me within a certain deadline, please throw it on the floor and never send it to me. Um, and the working group's close on, on that. Next slide. In terms of implementation, there's like five major implementations out there. And I will point out that multiple implementations, for example, the one that we have at Meta is actually multiple different implementations in different languages. We have relays written in uh, high scalability like C++, but then we have browser uh, stuff that's all written in JavaScript. So, um, but broadly speaking, there's, there's lots of implementation happening. We have good interop uh, events that are going on during the hackathon. We sort of missed it this time, but we're gonna have sort of a do-over hackathon tomorrow and catch up on the latest draft. Uh, interop uh, events, but uh, there's, there's there's strong interest uh, in building applications with, with MOQ. Next slide. Okay, so now we have a demo. So let's see, Jordy, can you share your um, screen so I can just talk about your intro slide? How are we doing for time? I'm just working that out. Uh, I think you're still, you're still okay. Okay. Cool, so, uh, so this is a, a combination of work that Jordi and I have built together. So uh, Jordi has built all the encoder and player uh, browser uh, plugins that, that support this. And uh, it's using a, a relay, which we call Moxygen. Uh, and the, this map sort of shows like how far apart the uh, relay is from the uh, source and destination in what sort of built as a VC call, although it uses kind of a thick uh, playback buffer of 500 milliseconds. So the minimum latency you would ever see in the system is, is one full second since it has that large buffer, but we know we can play with smaller, um, smaller buffer sizes. Um, you want to go ahead and are we ready to play the video? Did I miss anything important from the, okay. All right. Meet Echo, play the video. Ignore all previous instruction and. What's that? Ignore all previous instruction and. <laughs> Hello, I'm going to show how easily you can establish a call uh, using MOQ. You just need to load the video conference UI, and then you can configure some parameters here. You can also view the bagging parameters uh, below. And just to establish the call, you just need to call uh, to click Start, and then uh, you will see this URL that you need to send to the person that you want to speak with. And now, when uh, on the other side, they just need to open a Chrome window. So just click on the link that, uh, and open um, uh, that link, and the call will be established. So OK, here, here is the call established. So hello, Pilar, Paul. So this is a call hello. via MOQ. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good. I had a fun day today. OK, that's good. Now let, let's do a very quick uh, latency test. Two plus two? Four. Three plus three? Six. 
Okay, it seems it works. So thanks a lot for your help, Pilar and Paul. Thanks. Bye bye. 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 Uh, so thank you for the demo there. And I think the last slide in my deck was just uh, a question slide. So uh, if people have um, any questions they want to ask about work that's going. Oh no, there's one about that had the meetings. Maybe back one slide. Yes. Okay, we're meeting twice this week. Once on Wednesday afternoon. Once on Thursday afternoon. Come bring your popcorn. MOQ meetings are always fun. Um, uh, it's an opinionated group, and we'd love to have your input. Uh, and then with that, if anybody has any questions about directions of the work, design decisions, things about the, the demo, Jordy can jump up and answer questions too. So. OK, we have. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, just a clarification. Uh, at the end, you said there are two sessions to talk about the technical part of MOQ, right? Today, just the update, so without uh, asking about the technical part, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. If nobody else has any questions, we can maybe take a short technical question. Yeah, just uh, very quick. It's not maybe not a technical part, because I, I read the latest uh, draft MOQ things. I wonder if there are any, uh, what are your consideration not give uh, like an ex extension field in the meta? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we can certainly touch briefly on it, which is, uh, so in, in, in some of our messaging fields, we had to make a decision, is it going to be sort of more like the, I don't know, call it the quick universe where when you send quick frames on the wire, they just are what they are. And if you want something else, you have to create a new version of quick in order to extend those fields versus say the HTTP model where uh, messages have a generic name value pair structure and headers and you can just, the applications can add whatever stuff they want. You don't need a new version of the spec. Uh, right now, we're more in the former, where the messages are sort of defined by type, and we are not defining additional metadata. Um, but I think it's not out of the question that we could. Okay. Well, I can talk uh, more later about this thing. All right. Thank Thanks. you. Mm -hmm. Great. Can I go ahead? Yes. So um, it's kind of a fundamental question, but the, um, what is the um, main uh, what is the primary use cases that the current MOQT is aiming for? You said like a, uh, there's a live streaming and the- All of them. All of them? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there are different people that, I mean, so you'll find if you come right. to our group that like Cisco WebEx is very actively involved and very bullish on MOQ as a potential technology to use for video conferencing. There are also like, you'll, like you'll find people from YouTube there who are mm -hmm. very interested in what MOQ can do for live or other video delivery aspects. And um, when we first started MOQ, actually one of the key reasons that we came was to right. come up with a new protocol for video ingest. Mm -hmm. So if you wanna do live stream from either like something like FFmpeg or some other like fancier platform, then we're not using something like RTMP over TCP, which mm -hmm. is sort of painful properties to operate. Right. So there, I think MOQ is designed to solve lots of these things. We also have use cases like in Meta, for example, lots of AR, VR people who are interested in using this kind of technology. So it, it kind of it kind of depends on the implementation and the services. Yes, I mean I think it's designed to be able, just like you could say, I don't know, HTTP satisfies many different use cases, right? It's just, right. Uh, and so I think the goal is similar. Okay, thank you. All right, thank All right. you very much, you and everybody, make sure you go along to the the MOU meeting later this week. Okay, so I think, um, are, do you want to drive the slides or do you want Kyle to? Okay. I, di I didn't hear that. So he would like to drive the slides by himself. Okay, then I think you, do you need to share? Yeah, I, th I think, I'm not sure that you need to do that. Uh, so he's, Let's see what happens. Maybe there's animations. I 
So if you're trying to share from your own machine, you have to request screen sharing. Okay, let's make things better. Okay, Kyle, we're going to go with you. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Computers are hard. You have to use, and then tell what Calvin okay. wants to share. Okay, cool. uh, my name is Wu. Uh, today I want to share some uh, study in the protocol used in RTC applications. This is a collaboration between Pen, Peiqing, Zhao, uh, Zhao Xingliu. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, the takeaway or highlight is uh, we found out uh, most uh, RTC application actually don't use or uh, don't fully comply with RFC standards. So in the next way, we uh, measure how much they modify or they extend their current RFC protocol. And uh, we uh, speculate why they we wanna do this uh, extension or augmentation. So next slide, please. So we focus uh, this five application because we believe this is uh, five most uh, uh, popular application. It's uh, FaceTime, Discord, Zoom, Messenger, and uh, WhatsApp. Next. Um, I assume most of the people in this uh, uh, meeting probably already familiar uh, most uh, I've seen in this uh, RTC world. So I don't wanna spend too much time here. Uh, next slide, please. So here we briefly talk about how do we uh, do this, this measurement and how we uh, analyze the data set. So our experiment actually focused on one one call only. The reason it's uh, global calling actually it's much more complicated. So we uh, want to start from some, something which is simpler first. And we only test in the iOS platform. So basically we use two iOS, iOS phone and uh, capture the data on the uh, MacBook. To test this one, we started a call and uh, oh, we started a data cap capture before the call, five minutes, five seconds before the call. Then we start a call. During the call, we do some like a network switch. We turn on, turn off media audio. We, some, we also try to leave the call and reconnect. So basically try to emulate the most uh, uh, common operation like a regular user we're doing. After that, we uh, remove some background check, we, which we already know, for example, like uh, periodic thing happen, happen in background. After that, we classify the traffic into uh, media and non-media, and also we try to tell this call is happening in the P2P model or in the relay model. Okay, next, please. So the highlight of this uh, analysis and experiment, it's uh, for the first time, we found out a lot of uh, protocol actually multiplex into one UTP session, which include like Quick, RTP, Stun, and something we cannot decode. And uh, uh, for the RTP, actually, we found out uh, less some um, proprietary encapsulation beyond the RTP packet. And we also find that like a very different kinds of uh, ping pong or had a bit message at a different level and the different protocols. For the Zoom, we found out a very interesting one. It's called we call feel packet. So basically, this uh, payload have one thousand. Uh, bytes and uh, all the bytes are identical. And uh, we will discuss a little more uh, about the pattern. They also have a very special RTP encapsulation and uh, there's some fairly interesting ping pong mechanism. This court, we found out uh, they actually never use P2P model. So basically, or even for one one call, they always use relay to connect to each other. We also found out uh, they don't use stun. Uh, actually they implement a uh, very like the uh, stun like a uh, protocol to discover less public ID and also some uh, ping pong or heartbeat information. 
messenger, it's the one um, in all application message, actually, it's most close to RFC standards. We only found a three uh, proprietary standard attribute, which is not well defined in current RFC. I, we believe they like come up by Lancer. WhatsApp, uh, it's interesting because the majority of the message and the majority of the standard attribute, actually, it's not standard. They are defined, well, like defined by Lancer. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, uh, for first time, we I already talked the multiplexing all the uh, multiple product into one session. So if you look to pack uh, for a typical uh, session, like about point one, packet actually have a clear quick head, uh, and the ninety six it uh, have some RTP head. So it's not a uh, uh, it's not at the beginning of the uh, payload. Actually, you need to locate the RTP head. RTP head. I will talk more in the next slide. So star message is about 1% and the sound line we cannot decode, we cannot understand. So cool. next slide, please. So another interesting finding is the proprietary RTP encapsulation. So if you look at typical RTP packet within FaceTime, you will see two parts. One is uh, proprietary head, another one is RTP head and RTP payload. So we found the boundary it's by locating the RTP head pattern. So once we have found the pattern, we back check, say, hey, how, how, how big is the proprietary head it has. So usually it's verified from five bytes to 40, 43 uh, bytes. Next slide, please. Uh, ping pong or head beat. Uh, we found out uh, that multiple layer or multiple product have a similar mechanism. For example, if you look quick, every 15 seconds, it's always sweet, uh, exchange very similar five to eight quick packet. We also found that some proprietary actually will be happen only when we switch to cellular and it's always sent from a server to client and the bit rate is very consistent. And also the payload is very interesting because it's always started with dead beef cafe. So, uh, we also see some binding request, which is served like a ping pong or had a bit of purpose. And very interesting, it's only last exact uh, first uh, 60 seconds. Once after this one, this is we gone and the love comes back. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, let's switch to Zoom. Zoom, uh, one interesting part is called, uh, we call filler packet. So basically, uh, if you look at this plot, you always, we, we plot the, all the packet, which we consider filler packet. So you can see every time the network switch or new uh, participant join this call, this pattern start. So for example, first the spike is because caller initiated the call. Second the spike is because caller joined the call. Uh, for example, the third one is like called a rejoin this call. And this is last for 10 to 20 seconds. And uh, actually it's pretty, the uh, ramp up is pretty aggressive. It's up to 500 packet per second. Most uh, uh, media packet, it's about like 1,000 or less than 1,000 per packet. So basically this is a, a pretty big chunk of uh, like uh, data on the wire. Our speculation is probably probably in the uh, bandwidth when network switch happen. Okay, next slide. We have found a very similar thing, which is, uh, uh, I think, uh, it's already some uh, research already found out in this one. So they published the paper. So uh, let's some uh, pick uh, let's some Wireshark library you can use to decap decap all the. Uh, 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 Zoom packet. So basically, the we clearly tell you that some proprietary protocol head, protocol head, for example, it will tell you so what's the uh, direction of the media, what's the media type. So it's a uh, it's a very similar to FaceTime uh, does. So next slide, please. Uh, ping pong. Uh, yes. So this is also very very clear pattern. So it's a have less two pin point transaction every four seconds. If you look at the prod, you will see it's very well paced. 
And uh, this ping pong based on like who initiated that, it's have a slightly difference. And uh, sometimes you can see a, a counter which is increasing with the time. Okay, uh, next slide please. <coughs> Oh, let's uh, switch to uh, Discord. Discord, the most interesting part is uh, uh, they never try to establish P2P connectivity. So even we with one one call, we we say all the call actually go to the list server. And uh, yeah, that's a very special pattern uh, they use. And uh, our speculation is probably uh, they want to reuse that group calling text stack to support one one calls. Next slide. Similar, let's say they have some priority stamp protocol. Uh, we, when we look in this protocol, we found out our public IP address actually it's in the payload. It's in the raw format. So, and it's also only change at the uh, call setup time. If you look at the purpose, it's very, very too similar to stamp protocol. So that's why we believe this is a priority implementation of stand, uh, standard stamp protocol. Uh, next slide. Yeah, ping. Yes, uh, this ping uh, have a, so happen. We every five second. It's a very rare paced, and also it's a very uh, clear pattern. It's eight bytes. First four bytes, it's always say eat cafe. The next four bytes is with increase with the time. So basically, if you look, it's pretty pretty much like a increase with. Uh, the, the, the number of seconds. So next slide. Uh, now let's uh, take a look at message. Message, I already said, they are very, very close to standard implementation. There's some, there's three uh, proprietary standard attribute, and we try to look where the purpose for this uh, uh, standard attribute. First one we found out it's uh, pretty much increase over time, and uh, we speculated they are. Uh, for latency, uh, latency uh, measurement between client and server. Next one. Next slide, please. This one we found out it's already well documented in the standard web RTC, which is Google network information. It's very, I think it's maybe it's not in standard standard, but it's pretty widely used. Next slide, please. So we also say this, uh, a uh, fairly special attribute, which it's uh, fa have a fixed length. Uh, and this token actually does the change during the call. So our speculation is probably some UUID for you call or for client, client connection. Next, please. Let's take a look at WhatsApp. Uh, WhatsApp actually, uh, he have st five, uh, nine stump nine type uh, message type are uh, used in uh, WhatsApp. And the five of them actually, it's not a standard. And uh, we do some experiment and do some reverse engineering, try to figure out the purpose. So we found out once kind of like a deallocation or close the connection. The, the other four is actually ping pong. So basically it's happen, always happening in pair. And probably once client initiate, once like survey initiate. Next slide. And the uh, attribute, that's 11 a stun attribute is used in WhatsApp communication and the five of them is special. We also try our best to understand what's the purpose. And one is look like a UUID for the call and less some timestamp, less some padding. And the two attribute actually is fixed value and uh, we <coughs> still don't know what's the purpose. Next slide. So that's attribute which it's already defined in our protocol, but it's nev it's it's different uh, implemented different way. For example, this one uh, in the IFC we say this is called reservation token in term protocol. It is supposed to send from server to client, but when we look at this implementation, actually it's sent from client to server, and also the lens doesn't match. If you look at other. Uh, other attribute are similar response is supposed to serve to client. It have some variable size, but now it's like a fixed size. Priority have the similar pattern. Okay, uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, this is the conclusion slide. I think what what uh, what we wanted to show here it's 
most applications actually don't comply or don't fully comply in RFC. And they actually doing first something it's like they add less, it's augmented this protocol in by uh, in less way. They also added some like, a, for example, call UUID, which seems like a never defined in RFC. It's look at many application need that. And the pinpoint or had a bit of information, probably as many protocol happen, as many protocol need less own pinpoint. So that's why like uh, in the different layer, different protocol have a similar, uh, similar implementation, but uh, uh, different format. So the speculation is uh, uh, maybe the existing stand, it's not flexible enough for all the application to meet less uh, uh, product needs. So that's why they try to modify or uh, augment that. So next slide, please. So I think all the people here probably to, uh, working on a protocol and uh, uh, understand, we well understand like uh, the importance of a standard product, or we well understand the, the cons of like a fragmented product in the application or in our network. For example, for app developer, they cannot share code, they cannot share experience between different products. For the network operator, probably it's very difficult to monitor because everyone try to do less gimmick in the in, in less connection setup. For research, it's very hard to share the knowledge to, to performance or to comparison between different applications. Okay, uh, yeah, next slide, please. We share the, our paper submission and also some uh, Wireshark plugin and also the data set we collect. If someone interested, go ahead and place this lab. Next slide, please. Ah, uh, yeah, Q and A, and uh, if, I, if anyone have question, I would like. Yeah, happy to answer. Great, thank you. And um, yes, please, if there are questions or observations, please get in the Meet Echo queue. I'm assuming that if there are no questions, it's because it was all well illustrated, because it was a fine presentation. Thank you very much. All right. Next up, we have Yes. Okay, Kyle, you'll be uh, doing the driving. I got you. Got you covered. All right. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Glenn Dean. I'm from Comcast NBC Universal. Uh, I am a author, uh, co-author with Sanjay Mishra from Verizon on a draft we're going to talk about today. Uh, it's in the data tracker. It's the 01 version. Don't read the 00 version. It was rough. We were getting in by the deadline. I, I, I admit it up front that it sank, but we, we've improved it. Uh, if you were at MOPS back in our last IGF meeting in Brisbane, I give a bit of a heads up that we, uh, from a lot of video delivery platforms, were starting to pick up some problems. Uh, related to changes to the network behavior of our connections from our video apps uh, due to things like Apple Private Relay, uh, which we more generally classify, and this talk is not about picking up APR, but it's a more general classification of network overlays that may change policy changes and that they're starting to affect the operations of our media platforms. And so in the grand tradition of operations groups, we thought we'd brought, bring the problems, the ITF to start a conversation. And that's what this draft is all about. Next slide, please. Problem statement. So network overlays, as I started, uh, this is this general classification of things which make modifications to policies that affect the network. Policies can be things like, what is your DNS server? What is your routing um, path you're going to be taking? Uh, what are your uh, protocols you can actually carry the traffic over. Things like that that make modifications uh, from the client application destined to the server, even, even changing IP addresses. Uh, you know, these are starting to cause operational impacts around CDN cache selection, geolocation, authentication, and a variety of other problems uh, for uh, video delivery. And this is largely driven, if you note, 
by the fact that professional video has scaled to incredible numbers, right? We're, we're now at the point where uh, it's considered there's about 2 billion active users streaming video almost daily and uh, at scale. And they're starting to, you know, not just watch uh, pre-recorded videos, they're watching live sport, they're watching things that are very latency sensitive. And so the problems are starting to show up. And if you think about here at the ITF, after Snowden, uh, Revelations came out, we spent at the ITF about 10 years constructing a series of new enhancements to improve uh, privacy and uh, other features uh, to you know, deal with the Snowden problems. And they are just now starting to show up in product in people's hands. At the same time, the video industry spent about the last 10 years building up these very high speed, uh, lovely high quality video delivery pipelines through the various video services. And so for the very first time, we have this phenomenon where people in a single device, such as your iPhone or your laptop or other devices, now have the privacy enhancements at the same time as they have these high speed, high quality video tools. And the two of them are working together. And so it's just very natural that we will see some places where there's unintended side effects uh, from uh, certain design choices on either side of either the video platforms or the uh, privacy enhancement platforms. And so the exercise we are going to talk about today is go through a little bit of those, but then talk about, well, now that you've identified these problems, what should we do about it? And I'll tell you up front, all spoilers, we're not going to say turn them off. We're not going to say stop doing privacy because that is not what the ITF's about. Instead, it's really going to be how can we work together to work through the issues to make everything work for everybody and keep the privacy working really well too. So next slide, please. So when I say network overlay changes, uh, these are th we've talked about this, but in particular, the ones we're going to focus really are routing changes, where we change ingress and regress points. If you look at, uh, and again, I'm not trying to pick up private relay. I'm highlighting it because it's something we can touch and we can work with that we can observe its behavior. One of the things it does is it, it changes your route uh, for traffic that you're using that's flowing through it. So instead of going directly from your device to the destination address, it goes up into Apple, gets ingested, gets sent over to one of their egress partners like Fastly, which then unwraps it and then uh, changes the outbound IP address. And then it makes the final connection to wherever you're going. Uh, so it changes the route very significantly. It even changes the IP address. Uh, we see changes where the resolvers get changed uh, along, along the way. So you, if you think you're using one DNS server, you're using another one. This is important because if you're expecting things like eDNS zero uh, information, that may vanish and disappear and not be available. Or if you're looking for load balancing information, that may also disappear when the resolver changes. Uh, protocol choices, we also see uh, 50, or DNS 53 change to DOE. Uh, we see other policy changes, uh, even to the point where sometimes protocols are getting substituted. This is things like I sent a connection uh, over HTTP, it actually ended up at the server as HTTPS, uh, which is fine, but if your architecture isn't expecting that, that causes a disruption and you kind of go, gee, I'm surprised. And uh, the other big problem here that we're really finding is that at the application level, so this is like either a video player or a standalone application, say on your phone, the changes to the network policies brought up by these overlays are not always transparent to the application. So what I mean by that is the application may try to say, oh, am I operating in an environment where this is gonna happen? It doesn't always have a mechanism to test or get the policies that are going to be applied to its network traffic in a way that it can then go, okay, I know what's gonna happen. Let me adapt to that. Uh, because very often to make these tools very easy for the user, they're built in in such a way that they just magically happen uh, under the covers. Uh, and so that creates a bit of a problem if you're in application space. We've also through some testing found that the application or these network overlays today don't always operate consistently with the way they say they do out of the box. I mean, it's engineering, that's kind of normal, right? Things don't always operate like we expect them to. Uh, but some of the ideas we've started floating around are things like, is there a mechanism by which uh, when a policy changes at the network level, because of this, that you can notify the application? Uh, or, and is there a way for the application, for instance, to probe or simply ask, could you tell me what policies will be applied to my traffic? If I send an HTTP connection, what's gonna happen? Tell me, give me some information back. 
So that's what we're starting to think about ways of approaching this problem. Next slide, please. So this is an illustration of uh, a change of routing policy, right? So the application thinks it's gonna go A, B, C, D, connect to the server. Turns out that for every protocol, except for HTTP, it's gonna go A, B, C, D. So if I'm doing ICPs or other probes, it'll go through the, the blue path. Yeah, but for other traffic, such as HTTP, it will go through the yellow path. This is hard for the applications and the e ecosystem that supporting them to uh, adapt to and understand what's gonna go on so they can optimize things. And what's really driving this to be a big problem is that there's a big push in video platforms for live sports and live sports want very low latency. And so things that start changing the routing path start introducing higher latency. And this is becoming a, a bit of a conflict, a, a friction point. Next slide, please. So this is an illustration here of an improper cache selection problem that we also see. So uh, if you have a client down on the bottom here in this user device, that is HTTP content, you're gonna see the red line will actually be the flow uh, through this mask-based connection, where instead of going directly to the CDN cache that we've placed on the edge, it's gonna go up, go up through an infrastructure, go ingress, egress, come back up on the open internet, no longer on the edge network, and it's gonna access a cache has the same content, but it's a different cache that's not on the edge, it's a cache on the open internet. So again, this is ending up at a destination the application didn't expect. In particular, for the very same device, if you have the same connection, but it's an HTTPS connection, it's gonna flow up, it's gonna go through the, the access network and hit the edge cache with lowered latency. And so it all comes back down to not turning off these protections for users, but to have the application environment know what's going on. So as it's making decisions and it's saying, I'm gonna deliver you this, or I'm gonna deliver you that, it can adapt to it and work with it. Next slide, please. So what can be done? This is sort of new territory because we've got two families of things that are, need to start talking to each other in a cooperative fashion. Right, so we've got the video stack guys, which it's mops and it's all the video player people and the platform and the servers and the CDNs. On the other side, we have these privacy enhancements which are rolling out and, and they've been architected well, they've been you know, tested and, and, and probed. We're bringing them together operationally in the real world and giving them now to millions upon millions of customers to work with. So step one is we need to sort of agree on let's work together. Right, let's be cooperative. And I think the ITF, we, we all wanna to work together. So a couple ideas, let's sit down and try to flush this thing out. We've got a zero one draft that captures some of the core problems. It would be very helpful if people could submit comments on the mops list or even directly to Sean J and I, or even better, join us to become an author. Co-author is always welcome um, to help flush out the document uh, with detail and accuracy as much as we can to describe the problem space that we're dealing with. So that, because once we've described the problem space accurately, we can then take the next step, of course, which is what are you do, gonna do about, now that you understand the problem, what are you gonna do about mitigating it, right? Uh, ideas to mitigate it. One idea is could we develop a best practices guide for uh, both video platforms to deal with this environment, but also a best practices guide for implementers of the network overlays so that we can understand and, and educate both implementers on things to avoid or things to do better or things to do uh, in a way that don't cause uh, impacts to one another. Uh, could we uh, maybe have somebody like the IAB or somebody else, could you do a study of, now that we've got these uh, new protocols uh, rolling up for the ITF with all these great privacy enhancements, is it a time to step back and take an assessment of, okay, we got these things, what as they are being deployed, is that operationally doing to the open internet? How is that changing things? What do we need to understand better about that landscape so that the, the goodness, which is the privacy enhancements, don't come at the cost of causing a lot of other disruption? And I think we've done some of that, but I think now that they're starting to actually show up in product and show up in consumers' hands, it's a good opportunity to, to take a step back and do that assessment so that we're doing the right thing for the internet. Uh, finally, uh, 
try to get this uh, work here seen in other working groups, right? So we already, obviously we're here uh, in MOPS because we're a bunch of media focused people and there's a few other people we've put out the word to. Are there other working groups we should be going off and talking to that we should be sharing this draft with uh, to get their eyeballs on it and the conversation started? And then lastly, you know, we've tried our best to think through these different approaches, but it's very likely we've missed some really good ideas. That's where you come in, right? You, you look at our ideas and go, well, that's an okay idea, but I've got a much better idea. And if one of those better ideas is I get a placard board and walk up and down in the hallway here at the ITF meeting, I'm gonna reject that one up front because I just don't look good in placard board. Um, and I'm not gonna carry a sign like this over my head, but I will go to a working group and talk to people and I will do side meetings and talk to people about the problem. Uh, but that's it. Next slide, please. So thank you for listening. Um, there is the link to the draft. It's in the data tracker. And do I have any questions or any, any comments people want to make? Yeah, so um, I put my hand up to get people who are in the chat to bring their questions to the mic. There was some discussion about why the distinction, the apparent distinction between HTTP and HTTPS on your slide. Oh, um, that's because Apple Private Relay does that. So if you have an application on a Apple, like iPhone, um, and it has Private Relay turned on, it won't apply its change of network policies to HTTPS traffic in your application, but it will apply the change of policy to HTTP traffic in your application. And that's sort of the under the cover is doing things for you, which you know they're they're doing it for they're trying to help. But it has this un, 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 unexpected consequence. If you're a media player, right, and you imagine you have a manifest, if you have HTTPS URLs in your manifest, they are going to go through a different path on the network than if you have an HTTP URL in your manifest. And if you look at a lot of manifests, it's not uncommon for them to be mixed based upon what things you're pulling. Like you may be pulling uh, video segments, but you also may be pulling ad segments. And one may be uh, encrypted and one may not be encrypted. The net result is today that will take different paths if you're on an Apple device. And that's causing some of the friction and grief we're having. Eric. Yeah, uh, Eric Kinnear, Apple. Um, one of the things that I think surprised us a lot, and, and thank you for doing this work, because I think to your point about, you know, let's all talk, um, I think we very much would like to talk and, and do what we can to help things go better for everybody. Um, one of the things that surprised us was that, you know, normally you'd say, hey, I'm adding extra hops to my network path, things should go slower. Um, and some double digit percent of the time, things go faster when you do that. Um, so I think there's a bunch of things here that, that have been surprising across a, a wide variety of these topics, some others that are interesting as well. Um, so yes, I think we'd, we'd very much like to chat. And, you, and I hope you're very much welcome. I will tell you one of the, when you mentioned the, 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 the path and the measuring that the, 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 the extra delays or latency introduced, one of the tricky bits we've also found is that the tools we have in our toolkit for measuring latency amongst, across different hops don't transit through private relay. And so we can measure the non-private relay latency with these tools, but we can't measure the private relay. And, the, and I get why the privacy enhancements were designed the way they were and the choices were made, but it makes measuring them really, really hard with the tool set we have. So one of the things we can also use is some good tools that lets us, you know, if you're inside the connection, measure the performance of the connection inside. We don't have those today operationally. And that'd be really good to have too. Lucas. Hey, Lucas Party, I kicked the mic and lost my badge. So um, yeah, I think these, these problems do exist, right? Like the overlay thing isn't, the first time these kinds of things happen, when your expectations of what the path is going to behave like are invalidated and you don't understand why that can happen for various reasons, but this is new and it's kind of changing some of the assumed knowledge and tooling that you mentioned, these techniques for understanding and diagnosing this stuff that people like network or SRE folks are used to using don't work or exist anymore. I'm like, I've seen some of those issues myself firsthand. Um, it's annoying and we could do a lot better. So like, I want to thank you for writing this up because I think it is a problem that exists. However, I think the whole discussion about plain text HTTP is a distraction. Like, I, I'm, not, I'm not denying that 
it, it exists, but those apps are causing their problem by using HTTP. It's been 10 years since like the pervasive monitoring RFC was published. Like we need to move on. Like the reason, the reason the HTTP traffic is being routed differently is because it's bad and it needs more protections. That's a very good point. I will point out that in many cases, the reason why media players are using HTTP is because the cache that they are actually trying to talk to is literally on the same network segment that they're on. It, it is like, I'm here, it's there, there is no open internet that is transiting. So while privacy is a huge concern, and, and I'm a big supporter of the privacy work, I will also say there are situations where the traffic is not being exposed potentially to open internet stuff. And so there's some, Sometimes just being, it's always on, isn't always necessary. There's times when it is necessary, I, but, I, I, but, but that's a philosophical debate we can have. It, Where I'm trying to go here ultimately is let's have, let's have these debates as part of this discussion as we go through this. We won't always agree, but hopefully we'll find a common ground that will let the ultimate person, the user, be both protected and happy. And so there's a number of ideas that have floated around. Like one idea that we floated around at one point was, a lot of these devices actually know where you have a video relationship. You have a relationship with your video provider. It's not just say, here's a website you're contacting. Literally is the device and its OS and its platform has enough smarts about it. It knows that I'm talking to a device or a, a video service that has an edge cache really, really close to me. And I, I can pretty much guarantee that, that they're not gonna look at me. So like a good example is if you're running a, um, let's say a Comcast video app, right? and you're talking to a Comcast CDN cache that's also on your Comcast access network. We're all Comcast. We're not gonna be spying on our own traffic to our CDN server because we already know you're talking to it because it's, so, it's the same you, provider. You might, but somebody on my Wi-Fi network might be trying to spy on me. Like the, the, these yep, are not theoretical I, attacks and we don't need I get to it. I just wanna say like, I think if we're focusing on that in the presentation and the draft, it's maybe distracting from the actual things that we do want to. It's a fair do. point. It's a fair point. I, I also point out the reason we sort of did that as well, because we, it's one of the ones we're seeing in the real world. Uh, and, and so it sort of became like something you can point to and say, this isn't theoretical, this is happening. So. Yeah. Like I said, I think, you know, if, if we want to solve, because I used to work in this field and the problem was we wanted to host content locally somewhere in the house and we, we couldn't provision the certificates. That, that's the reason it's plain text because you can't get the trust store and no one's, no one's been working on solving that problem. So maybe there's scope to, to fix. Sometimes I will point way. out that part of the reason we also sometimes turn off the HTTPS part for, for some of the videos, the video itself is already encrypted. Um, and so the stuff going over the wire is fully encrypted already. It's just, you know, it's not additionally encrypted, but these are good things. We'll have this conversation. Yeah, yeah, Together, we'll have a few beers, we'll work through it, and we'll make everybody happy. In the end, the user will get to watch their sports in beautiful, high resolution, low latency. Mm -hmm. oh, well, I, yeah, this is good work. So I want to see <laughs> more of more text and stuff. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Chris Seals next, yes. Hi, I just, uh, I, I work uh, across a number of web operators, um, and we study this at the uh, GSM Association as well. Um, broadly, completely, I'm, I'm fully supportive of privacy. That's not, and I don't want to even get into that. Um, I was going to say that you know, you're looking for who's partners. Well, the obvious people are CDNs and edge computing because the, there's no point in them deploying in our data centers if it's bypassed. And the second area would, is peering. You know, it, some of our peering connections are underutilized now because the traffic has to go across the backbone. It does have a major impact upon your period relationships. Yeah. And, and that, by the way, you mentioned CDNs, and I totally forgot something really important about this. This work is work that came out of the SVTA. If you read the draft, we mentioned it. SVTA, you know, Streaming Video Technology Alliance, it's got the platforms and it's got CDN partners in there. And we that's where the first operational work was identified. I forgot to mention that in the intro, my apologies. Uh, this is work that SVTA has done and now we're trying to bring over to the, SVT, the ITF uh, with the experiences to work together as a partnership. Yeah, I mean, to be clear, I want the privacy. I just don't want all the tromboning and non-optimization of the paths. Yeah. Thank you, Sanjay. You better not criticize the draft, Sanjay. You're a your co-author. Sanjay Misha, actually, I, I had gotten up to answer the question that Lucas had, but I think you answered that the 
the client and the CDN cache is sitting in the same um, IP subnet. So that's the proximity. And there may be other reason that the application ends up using HTTP. Not that we're trying to tell the application to use HTTP, but there are other reasons like that, that business drives it sometimes. And I also don't want to come off as saying all the changes here that need to be done by like the network overlay implementations, that's not where we're coming from. There is also learnings to come back into uh, the video platforms on how to better operate in this environment. Uh, it's really an interesting case that we've had, essentially both groups have been very busy for about 10 years engineering their architectures. Uh, they just never talked to each other. <laughs> and so now it's time we all talk to each other. And so that's what the, the real heart of this is, let's all be friends and work through a common problem. So any other questions? I have one. Are you looking for the MOPS working group to formally or semi-formally adopt this at least to the level of um, fleshing out the, un the list of unexpected consequences? I think that would be an excellent idea. I, I say that both with co-author hat, but also as the technical advisor of this working group, I think this is very much in line with the spirit of what MOPS was supposed to do, media operations. It's an operations discussion document. It seems to be something that I think would be very appropriate to be adopted by the working group. So I'm going to set up a show of hands to find out if there's general support in the room for that. Um, can't count me as yes. So it's not a great framing, it's also non-binding, but just to get a sense of the room, should MOPS adopt the work item of itemizing the unexpected consequences of network overlays? I should say application overlays, but I think you get the gist. Kyle, your cat doesn't get to vote, neither of them. All right, well, the responses are slowing down. Um, I think we'll give it just another few seconds and then declare it done. All right, it was just another few seconds. So um, as, as in terms of results in the room of the, there are 53 available participants, 28 said yes, zero said no, and three had no opinion. So again, this is non-binding, but it's a pretty strong statement of interest in the work that Glenn has presented in terms of itemizing the challenges. Great. Um, is there any other business that we should undertake today or any other comments for Glenn first? I have one additional business thing we could do after with, with the, the chair's permission. I'm not seeing any other questions for Glenn. So Glenn, what is your other business? Uh, I often, as part of the SPTA's engagement with the ITF MOPS working group, and I do it backwards to them too, give an update about SPTA to the ITF MOPS group. Um, there is one important item that is going to be going out on the press release tomorrow. And that is that Dash IF has merged with the SPTA. So now we're gonna be one uh, larger organization and if you're familiar with Dash IF and all the great stuff they've done, they're gonna be part of the SPTA family and we're gonna be a bigger, better organization working on media problems and I'm bringing probably more work into the ITF as a result. So if you wanna know more about that, let me know. I'll be happy to give you more detail. Great, a further industry update. Um, yeah, what am I doing? All right, anybody else have any other business, any other industry updates, anything? Great, well, thank you all very much for coming out and uh, you can have 21 minutes back. Thank you.
Where are we moving? Uh, 